Hello everyone, this is Greg Alexander, and welcome to the SBI Podcast. This is a very exciting show today because we get to speak to an executive who has led product development teams who have delivered products that fly off the shelves, literally. It's no coincidence that success has followed our featured guest who leads the product development team that has powered SaaS technology success story beyond trust. Furthermore, I've seen firsthand how today's guest interlocks with functional peers in sales and marketing to achieve the corporate goals. So sometimes sales and marketing, it's tough to make the number. It's even harder when you don't have a partner in the product team that's giving you products that people wanna buy. So if you're interested to learn more about how product marketing and sales can work better together to make your number, this show is for you. I hope you enjoy it and stick around. Welcome to the SBI Podcast, offering CEOs, sales and marketing leaders ideas to make the number. Welcome to the SBI Podcast, a weekly broadcast dedicated to helping you make your number by getting your peers to share with you how they are making theirs. Today we're going to demonstrate how to understand buyer behavior to accomplish a product market fit. So why this topic? So revenue growth will disappoint if your products do not address an urgent problem of a specific buyer that he or she is willing to pay to fix. And your product must do this better than the alternatives. Sometimes product leaders build products that produce customer benefits that do not address the buyer's evaluation criteria. This results in poor win rates, wasted resources, and poor revenue performance. My name's Greg Alexander. I'm your host and CEO of SBI, and helping me today with that demonstration is an executive who knows a lot about this topic. His name is Brad Hibbert, the Chief Technology Officer for Beyond Trust. Brad, welcome to the show, and please introduce yourself to the audience. Thanks, Greg, and uh, thanks for having me. Uh, Again, my name is Brad Hibbert, so I I run the uh, the strategy and the product group and engineering group over at, uh, at Beyond Trust. And tell the audience what Beyond Trust does. So, uh, Greg, I know you, you talk a lot to technology companies, and I'm sure your listeners hear a lot about uh, a lot about the, the struggles that they have. And, and I think what you hear is a consistent theme. Um, you know, organizations around the globe continue to struggle with protecting their their environments from from these attackers. Um, could be bad guys getting into the environment, or it could be insiders misusing or abusing their privileges. And so, what we do is really try to to enable companies to have proactive ways to shrink or reduce that attack surface, if you will, across those those asset and those privileged vulnerabilities. And then if th- bad things do happen, to provide mechanisms where they can quickly respond and, and mitigate or contain those 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 uh, those breaches. Okay, so a cybersecurity company, software company in the cybersecurity space. Absolutely, yeah. Okay, fantastic. And your role there is to determine what you guys are going to build and get it to market and help your customers. Do I understand that correctly? That's right. So, so for my, for my my team is responsible for my, everything from some product strategy. So, going out talking to customers, understanding kind of what we need to build, um, product uh, management. So, how we're going to actually execute against those strategies, and then product engineering, delivering those uh, those uh, those capabilities to market, and then product support. So, making sure we build those relationships with customers over time. Okay, fantastic. All right. So, let's jump into my first question here, which is kind of a thirty thousand foot question, but I want to make sure that we're sequentially going through these questions and we're educating the audience as much as possible. So here it is. So what sure. buyer problems are you trying to solve at Beyond Trust? Yeah, so uh, again, I, I think from a, a, you know, if you take a look at the products that, that we have, um, as you mentioned, in the sec- cybersecurity space, uh, we have two product families. Uh, one is more on the, the asset risk side, so the vulnerability management space, and the other is more on the, the privilege management space. And, and really, the, the problems we're trying to solve is to help people get ahead of the curve with respect to, to uh, protecting their, their, their environments. And so from a benefits perspective, uh, we help people um, reduce that attack surface, so improve security, uh, achieve compliance, which is important. Uh, they, they have to, uh, they got an audit finding or something, they have to, have to prove to the auditors that they're doing the right things uh, with respect to management. Uh, we need to uh, drive operational efficiencies into the environment. A lot of organizations that implement uh, uh, technologies uh, from a security perspective, it has a negative impact on operations. So, so you want to overcome that. Uh, and then lastly, we want to provide uh, a visibility and control um, so that they can mitigate uh, these risks on a, on a, on a go-forward basis. Okay, very good. Very crisp answer. 
well-articulated set of problems that you solve for customers, which is really step one when you think about coming to market with products that uh, people want to want to buy, which is obviously very important if you're going to try to grow revenue faster than your industry and your competitors. All right, let me go to the second question, which is in terms of buyer behaviors. You know, what buyer behaviors are you observing? that provide evidence that the problems you just articulated to us actually exist? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. So, and, and, I'll, and I guess I'll answer in a couple of ways. You have a very unique approach to the market. So as I mentioned, we have these, these two product families really to provide visibility across that, that, that threat spectrum from outsiders to, to the insiders. Uh, one product family focused on vulnerability management, the other on privilege account management. And uh, within each of those product families, we have specific modules. And those modules are designed to solve specific uh, challenges, or, 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 or I mean, we kind of call them use cases that, that would solve the problem for the customers. And so within the, in the vulnerability space, that's traditionally been more around the sort of in the sweet spot of security teams, right? So typically have the, the security buyer would be, would be buying those products for a, a, a broader solution or a broader visibility across, the, uh, across their environment. And the challenges that we see, again, you know, they, they struggle with just keeping up with uh, the sheer number of vulnerabilities that they need to manage. So you get this onslaught of information coming in and they have to understand a couple of things. One is that they have visibility over all the risk. And two is when they get all of that data I mean, how do they prioritize and make sure they're doing the right things in the right order to mitigate that risk that's going to have the biggest impact on their business. And so from a, a, a behavior perspective, we're seeing on the vulnerability side, a lot of organizations now trying to extend visibility of their solutions beyond the traditional assets. So you talk about cloud, you talk about mobile, you talk about sort of cloud deployed investments and so on. Uh, and then they're starting to try to implement more, uh, uh, you know, infuse the data stream with more context so they can make better decisions quicker. So uh, behavior analytics, strong intelligence, strong reporting, those sorts of things. So those are typically the things that we talk to our customers about and that we see. Um, we see that evidence, of course, uh, uh, with, uh, with the discussions we have with analysts, uh, with the advisory boards that we have. Uh, we're always out talking to customers. So we get a lot of feedback mechanisms to kind of, to kind of drive that product direction. Um, the PAM side is a bit more interesting, right? So the PAM side kind of grew up from the operations side. And so what we've seen is really a, a, a transition of the buyers from being more operationally focused to being the security teams. And when that happened, and we kind of kind of all that funnel up to the CISO, um, of course, the security teams have a broader mandate. So it's no longer trying to protect assets, maybe on an application or department level, but you're trying to take a broader, more strategic view across the organization. So from that perspective, what we've seen is, is um, is really organizations taking a step back. They started to realize like vulnerability, you know, privilege account management is a, is a requirement. It's a critical security layer within their, their multi-layered security program, if you will. But because it's new to, uh, to the security teams, it's less mature uh, in a lot of organizations. So uh, from that perspective, we're starting to see the demand from security teams to implement these products. Um, while they do have a broad uh, demand, so they have to solve a number of use cases, they typically can't consume or absorb all that technology at once. Right. So we can't get in there and talk about, hey, we can do all of these 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 broad things with you with our platform. Uh, what they're looking for is is very uh, specific uh, solutions for for their for their specific challenges at hand. And so what we need to do when we go in and we talk to customers is is to um, to solve those specific challenges that they have with those specific modules that we have that snap into that platform. And then once we kind of do that and show them that we can solve those specific pains. And maybe it's around uh, password uh, management, around uh, third-party vendor access. Maybe it's around securing their, their cloud environment for, for DevOps or something like that. So we under understand those use cases. Once we prove to them that we can, that we can solve those, those problems, we can earn the right to have those broader discussions with their customers about the platform value and the corporate value. But they're certainly, I think from a behavior perspective, they're certainly focused on those problems at hand. And, and we need to listen to our customers and address those before we start to start having these, these broader conversations. Okay, um, so we're clearly listening yeah. to the market, which is fantastic. And that takes me to my last question in this segment here, which is what benefits of your product or solutions do your customers actually buy on? Yeah, that, that's another great question. So as I mentioned, we have, uh, we have these portfolios, multiple products, multiple modules that snap into this, this architecture that can you know, feed into this analytics engine. Um, but you know, and each module has you know, different benefits, right? Because they're solving different, different use cases. But at a high level, you know, sort of the 30,000 foot level, I think what they're, what they're really looking for is to tighten security, right? So shrinking those attack surfaces, shrinking those exposures. And it could be you know, reducing privileges, it could be uh, better password management. So, so it's really shrinking the attack surface and risk that they have in the environment. 
Uh, the other thing that they look for is being able to uh, achieve compliance. So show the auditors that they have the, the tracking mechanisms, the audit capability, the depth of auditing uh, that they're looking for with some of these mandates that are coming out. Uh, the third thing I think the benefit that they buy is, you know, our design is to be non-intrusive. You can't put more burden on the operations teams uh, than they already have today. So you have to have solutions that are non-intrusive and you have to go through that with your customer in the POC to show them how you can solve those problems and, and be an enabler for operations and not, not, not a barrier. Uh, I think the, uh, the other area I think is um, if someone does get in, having the data, you know, the analytics and the reporting so they can very quickly respond. And so that is, you know, detecting and containing the breach with the dynamic access control. So, so at a high level, those are kind of the module level benefits that our customers buy on. And we show those benefits with the feature sets that we have with each of the modules, you know, in the markets that they compete. And then on top of that, of course, you get the platform story. You know, we have the broadest, most, uh, I think, solution set out there. So as they snap into the platform, the benefits of uh, total, lower total cost of ownership, simplified architectures, those things that play, start to play in as well. Okay, fantastic. All right, we're going to take a break here, but before we do, I wanted to uh, make sure the audience understood what we were just talking about there. So we've got a product leader with us this morning, and we're talking about growing revenue, and that often requires strategic alignment between the product team, the marketing team, and the sales team. I've seen a lot of marketing organizations and sales teams who fail to deliver, not because they're not doing their job, but maybe because their product leader isn't giving them the things that they need to be successful. That's clearly not the case here with Brett. You know, he was able to tell us the problems that he's solving for his customers. He was able to tell us and, and point to specific evidence that proved that those problems existed. So he and his team aren't just building cool things to build. They're building things that people actually want and that are gonna be in demand. And he was clearly able to tell us, you know, the evaluation criteria, the benefits or the features that the clients actually make purchase decisions against. And those are all woven into his product strategy, which downstream makes the life of marketing leaders and sales leaders much, much easier. So I just wanted to summarize all that for everybody. All right, we're gonna take a quick break from the interview to invite you to participate in a remarkable experience. I'd like to personally invite you to the studio, a multi-million dollar, one-of-a-kind, state-of-the-art executive briefing center located here in beautiful Dallas, Texas. It was developed by SBI specifically for ex executive teams inside of companies with aggressive revenue goals who, who don't have a lot of time to waste and have a lot on the line. Let's face it, to grow revenues faster than your industry and your competitors every month, quarter, and year, it's a pretty hard thing to do. A visit to the studio increases the probability of making your number because the sessions are built on the proven strength and stability of SBI's clients, people like Brad. So visit our website, salesbenchmarkindex.com forward slash the studio to book your visit. This is the SBI podcast. We'll be back in a minute. This is not a table. It is a stage where your performance is measured in numbers. If you reach them, you get an encore. If you don't, it could be curtains. That's why you need the well-rehearsed, proven sales and marketing strategies of SBI. Welcome back, everybody. This is the SBI Podcast. I'm Greg Alexander, your host. And today's guest is Brad Hibbert, the Chief Technology Officer for cybersecurity firm Beyond Trust. Today we're demonstrating how to understand buyer behavior to accomplish a product market fit. Let's jump back into the questions. So Brad, cybersecurity is a huge field. And, they, and people that are dealing with threats, there's all kinds of problems that you could go after. And yet you've been able to determine which problems you're going to solve and which ones you're not, and you've been able to prioritize, which is a really hard thing to do. So how do you decide which buyer problems are worth solving? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. And, and a lot of that comes down to discipline, as you mentioned, you know, making sure they have alignment with the rest of the business and, and with your customers. I think that, you know, we have all the financial models and stuff in place. You know, we're, we're over a hundred million dollar software company. We have uh, over 4,000 customers globally. So we have lots of, uh, of ways that we can collect data and, and get validation. Um, but I think, you know, uh, with all these models and, and, and so on, I think, I think a, a, from a 30,000 foot level, again, I think just three gates that we type, typically go through. Uh, one is to make sure that we have the expertise, right? So uh, is it in our wheelhouse? 
we know what we do. We know what we do it well. If it's vulnerability management or privilege account management, we've been doing it for decades, right? So uh, two healthy markets, two growing markets, and we have lots of things that we can do within these markets to, to continue to, to drive value for, for our customer base. Um, the second thing that we look at is, is alignment. And it's not just alignment with, you know, in synergy. So it's you know, synergy on top of the investments you've already made in the products, right? So, so that's one area. But it's also alignment with our sales teams. Are we selling the same buyer? Uh, it's not just about having multiple products that we can sell, but can these products be used and can they be integrated and can we create synergy and value for our customers and kind of value stack that, if you will. Uh, we have to make sure it's a, it also is a synergi synergistic with our partners. Uh, and then, of course, we get feedback from our customers to make sure that, you know, it makes sense for us to, to do this as, as, as an organization. So so I think, you know, expertise is, is certainly an area. Uh, alignment is, is the other area. And then execution risk is probably the third area. You know, we um, we're very, uh, I think, verbose with our customers when it comes to our roadmaps and, 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 and all the stakeholders. So we go out, we tell people what we're going to do. Um, we think that strategy, you know, having the idea is one thing, but it's 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 discipline and execution that kind of puts you a, a, ahead of the pack. And so we share a lot of information with our with our with our sales team, uh, with our field team, uh, you know, engineers, with our customers, partners, and so on. So when we when we take a look at doing other things, we have to take a look at you know, a can we can we execute against that, and how does that impact the current and existing commitments that we made to all those stakeholders to make sure that we we have agreement across the board. And uh, and again, we we back that up with all the financial models and attach rates and so on that that, that we uh, that we have through our through our uh, our programs and analytics. Yeah. Okay. Very good. My next line of questioning I need to set up just a little bit, and that is, you know, if you if you think about some of the classic product management, product marketing frameworks, maybe um, like from the guys at Pragmatic Marketing, you know, they've taught us that you want to go after problems that are urgent, right? So we want to sell painkillers, not vitamins, right? You want to mm -hmm. go you want to go after problems that are pervasive, so it can't be one-offs happening with a handful of customers. They have to be this problem has to be felt by a large group. And most importantly, the customer has to be willing to pay to fix the problem. So you just described for us um, your gating process, which I thought was fantastic. And I think many of our listeners might not be doing it as well as you are, so that would be good education for them. But when you think about the gating process with those three additional elements, you also have to ask a question is, you know, are the buyers already investing time, energy, and money to solve this problem? And therefore, like, what are we gonna do to get them to shift what they're doing today to solving the problem with us. It's like trying to get them from you know, their, their comfort zone and their status quo to doing something differently. And the question we always have to ask ourselves is, not only why change, but why change now? So how do you think about your product strategy in the competitive context? Yeah, yeah, that's a, it's a great point as well. Um, so, you know, and again, at a, at, a, at a high level, you think about these two security layers that organizations need to implement. And, and, uh, and from a cybersecurity and a risk perspective, it's always, you know, do you do nothing? Do you accept the risk? Do you, do you uh, shield the risk or do some level of protection and, and so on? So there's different, there's different levels of investment that a customer is willing to make. And, and from a security perspective, a lot of the times they will have some things in place, right? They'll have... They'll be using uh, manual to, manual uh, uh, processes, you know, if it's if it's uh, spreadsheets and stuff to manage passwords, for example, they'll be using that or some basic patching. Uh, they'll be using uh, native tools in a lot of cases. Uh, in some cases, they're using some some point solutions, right? So so we have to be you know conscious of, of all those of those uh, capabilities. I think you know the way that we differentiate and 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 the way that I organize my team is to be very again disciplined and focused when uh, when we're focusing on, on specific uh, uh, buyers so for example with my development team what I have is I have development teams uh, that are targeted towards a specific segment so maybe that's password management that could be a privilege management for Unix Linux that could be privilege management for Windows and in that I have a development team I have a product manager who's mandated with having the best of breed product in that market category as well as an entire development and support team that kind of goes with that um, so, so we have to be, you know, we know we have to go head to head against those competitors and we have to have the feature sets that, that address those, those uh, particular areas. Um, I think so. So that's one area. Um, as those teams are kind of building out the best of breed solutions. And I think that, again, we, we, we do that today. We also have to try to push them over the edge. So what's, what's the cost of migrating off of those existing products? So tighter security, improved compliance and you know, all of those things come into play. But also, come, customers aren't looking for point solutions anymore, right? They realize that these are very inefficient. Um, they're disjointed. Um, what they're looking for is more, you know, security layers that kind of integrate these capabilities together to give them that broader uh, sense of visibility, of visibility and control. So with my product teams, 
not only do I have them working on best of breed product modules for that market segment, I also have them looking at ways that they can add value up the chain to the platform and also across the chain into the other product modules that we, that we provide. So that if that buyer goes through his buyer journey, if you will, or, or through his adoption cycle, um, and they want to continue to expand their, 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 uh, their use case coverage to, to take on more challenges, you know, it's a natural fit to kind of continue it with us. Not only is it you know, to kind of get that product with the value of the platform, but the synergy between the products removes the barriers for our sales teams. Uh, it improves, you know, the the uh, the value they get they get out of the not only the, the second investment but the original investment that they made with us as well. So so we kind of go up that value chain, if you will, from a, from a benefits perspective. Okay, fantastic. All right, let's take another break. So, would you like to implement some of the things that Brad has talked to you about today? If so, I think we can help you. Consider having one of our experts spend some time with you in a workshop. To get a feel for what's covered in the workshop, go to sbi.tips forward slash 2017 workbook and download a copy of the workbook that we use in the workshops. Okay, we got one more segment with Brad after the break. We'll be right back. Meet Tom. He's the CEO of a leading medical device company, and this is his business partner, the latest SBI workbook. Every day, Tom uses the workbook to guide his sales and marketing vision. The yellow sticky? That's his corporate strategy. The pink sticky? His product roadmap. The dog-eared section? That's where Tom's mapped out next year's growth plan. The stain on the cover? That's from the champagne he popped open when they made their Q4 number. That was a good day, wasn't it, Mr. Workbook? How do you SBI? Take it to the next level with the SBI Workbook. Order your copy today at HowDoYouSBI.com. Okay, welcome back, everybody. This is our last segment with Brad, demonstrating how to understand buyer behavior to accomplish product market fit. We're going to jump back into our questions here. So, Brad, my, my next question for you is, I mean, how do you test for product market fit, not only, you know, at a macro level, but also in the individual sub-markets? Yeah, I mean, I, that, that's great. And, of course, we have all sorts of processes again, and we, we track a lot of data with our systems that, that, that kind of give us the details. But, you know, in general, I think it's, it's, you know, for me, it's fairly straightforward. We have gates that we go through. So, so again, I think the first gate is, you know, communication. You know, we have to communicate to our customers kind of what we're doing, and to sales teams what we're doing. Uh, and when I say communicate, um, it's not just, you know, um, broadcasting your message, right? It's, it's, you know, it's listening. It's getting the feedback. It's getting the feedback from all the stakeholders, right? Everybody from the sales team, uh, from the partners that are out there, from the customers themselves. We have an advisory board. We talk to analysts. You know, uh, my product team's always out in front of customers gathering this feedback. We also, interestingly enough, have, have ways that we gather feedback almost instantaneously from the sales team. As they go on site and collect data, they inject that into Salesforce, and then we get alerts on, on interesting things that they've seen in front of customers. So, so it's getting out there and communicating. And, and as I said before, you know, we're very open with the communications and what we're looking to do with the roadmaps and still with customers. Uh, the second thing is having flexibility. So you have to be able to adjust. You know, we have these roadmaps that we've put in place that we want to execute against, but we're flexible. If we see that the market's shift changing or priority shifting or our demands from customers with a theme that, that'll uh, positive, positively impact the broader customer base that we have, uh, then we need to take effect to that. So we have to, to refine that, refine the roadmaps, and then communicate those changes and validate those changes back out with all those stakeholders again. And then lastly, we have to execute. So once we have those plans, once we've gone out, we've talked to customers, we've validated that, we've got all the feedback from the different constituents, then we need to execute. And I think from a, from a beyond trust perspective, that's one area that we excel. We have a very strong development and delivery capability. And, uh, and, I, and just like you have to earn the right to, uh, to have those broader conversations with customers, we have to earn the right to, um, you know, uh, and to build that confidence with our sales teams and with our partners and with our customers that we deliver what we say we're going to deliver. So, so I think all those three things at a, at, a, at a high level are gates that we go through. And again, we have very detailed uh, um, uh, uh, checks, checks and balances along the way with our systems to, to verify a lot of these pieces. Okay, great. You know, as a lot of companies, software companies are moving into the cloud or have moved into the cloud, this allows them to pay attention to uh, usage 
of certain features in a product, as an example. And sometimes they use that information with the sales team to you know, proactively manage the adoption life cycle of a customer to make sure that we get the renewal, make sure we hold on to the client. Maybe it's also this type of information is used to present to the sales and marketing team various cross-sell and upsell, upsell opportunities. So do you guys have the ability to track feature usage? And if so, what do you do with the information? Yeah, we do. So, so that's another another great question. So, on the on the, uh, uh, and it's not just the usage of the product. We we really try to take a step back and understand the adoption cycle of the product. So, uh, for example, if it's privilege, you know, how does a typical buyer absorb these types of technologies? What what do they typically focus on first? What use cases do they focus on first? And we do that by vertical, and and we'll do that by by customer size as well, right? So, uh, maybe for customers, they start with uh, password management. Maybe it's third-party vendor access. Uh, once they, they they kind of mature that that piece of their security program, what is it that they go to next? Is it they go to secure their servers? Is it their cloud environment? Is it their desktop? So we track a lot of that information and pull that back into our systems. And then what we do is we arm our sales team, right? So when they're talking to customers, they can talk in a more intelligent way about how we can help them mature and progress their their, their adoption of these of these uh, security programs, right? Sales and marketing, you hit it right on the head. So with sales and marketing, we can also go back to our base. Uh, do uh, uh, do campaigns to talk about how we can take them to the next leg of maturity. Uh, we do email blasts, webinars, education webinars, tailored towards certain verticals so we can kind of guide them through that adoption phase, if you will. So so we certainly track a lot of that information and and, uh, and use that, not only with uh, developing the products themselves, because it allows us to understand where maybe we want to put more of our investment, uh, but also helps us uh, get alignment uh, with our partners in marketing and sales teams as well. Okay, fantastic. You know, for the audience, this is, uh, this is a great example on how to align marketing, sales, and product. And what do I mean by that? So take this concept of the adoption life cycle, okay? Let's just say that you're in a business that depends on getting repeat purchases or recurring revenue from your customer base, and you're a sales organization that deploys a land and expand strategy. So you land maybe in a department, maybe with a point solution, and your goal is to expand and move them along the maturity curve or the adoption life cycle. Wouldn't it be great if the product team was you know, on your hip with you saying, okay, hey, here's your territory, Mr. Sales Leader, and, and here's how your accounts are segmented based on the adoption life cycle. So therefore, for you know, segment XYZ, you should go talk to them about products four and nine because other people like them that were at that point in the adoption life cycle bought these products. And here was the benefits of doing that. It's the next logical investment along the way. That's what a great product leader like Brad can do for a sales and marketing organization and how it makes selling and marketing, i.e. making your number, that much easier. So just a great example of aligning product, marketing, and sales. Brad, unfortunately, we're out of time, but on behalf of my audience, um, you contributed a lot to our kind of body of knowledge here. I learned a lot of things today, so I know you're super busy. I really appreciate you being generous with your time and, and giving back to our kind of collective community. So thanks for being on the show. Oh, thanks for having me. Great time. Great. All right, and I want to thank the SBI audience, you guys, for tuning in. Last quarter, this show hit another milestone. Roughly one-third of our first-time podcast listeners came to our show after receiving a recommendation from a subscriber. I cannot think of a bigger compliment for our show, so thank you for recommending our show to your professional networks. If you want to learn more about this topic or the other areas that we focus on, go to salesbenchmarkindex.com forward slash register. This allows you to personalize your experience with our content. So for instance, you can choose the topics you're interested in and how often you want to learn about them. Okay, that's it for today. As always, until next time, I wish you good luck as you try and make your number. This has been the SBI Podcast. For more information on SBI services, case studies, the SBI team and how we work, or to subscribe to our other offerings, please visit us at salesbenchmarkindex.com.